So in this video, we are going to create the artwork that we are then going to color and add gradients to, as we see here. You should have already downloaded a folder called Animal Faces, and I'll let you choose which face you want to do for this exercise. What I would like you to do is come to the File drop-down menu and select New to open up the New Document panel. We'll be working with the standard letter size document, 8.5 by 11. I'm going to change the orientation, though, to horizontal. I'm going to keep the color mode as CMYK and the resolution high at 300 pixels per inch. And I'm going to say Create. I'm going to come to the File drop-down menu and select Place. I'll let you choose which face you would like to work with. I'm going to choose the fox and select Place. With my image placement tool, I'm going to click and drag that like so position that at the center of my screen. I'm now going to set this up as a guide layer. We've done this before. Remember, what we need to do is select it. I'm going to come to my transparency panel, and I'm going to change the blending mode to multiply. I'm going to reduce the opacity down to 50%. Once I've done that, I'm going to open up the layers panel. This is now my guide layer. I don't want to work on this layer, so I'm going to lock it and I'm going to create a new layer. This will be my working layer. And I always want to have my guide layer above my working layer because I don't want to obscure my photo reference. So I'm going to take this new layer two and drag it below that layer. So I am now ready to begin. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come to the View drop-down menu. I'm going to select Hide Artboards. I just want to be able to see the imagery on its own. So this is how we're going to do it. We are going to be using our shape tools. I'm going to come over here and float those out into their own panel, as well as our line segment tool. Let me do the same with that. I'm going to click and hold and drag that out like so, so that I have those tools showing. Let's start with the largest shape first, which is the cranium. I'm going to come over here to my ellipse tool, and I'm just going to click and drag an ellipse like that. I'm going to make sure that the color is set to none and that the stroke is set to black. I'm going to use my black arrow to reshape this. I'm not going to worry too much about the hairs outside of this right now. Those can be added later, but I'm just thinking about the underlying structure of the largest shapes. The next shape is the snout. I'm going to come back to my ellipse tool, and I'm going to create a, an ellipse that roughly follows the snout like that. Put this up so I can see this a bit better. I'm going to, again, draw another ellipse that this time defines the, the lower jaw. I'm going to use the line segment tool to draw lines that connect the snout to the cranium, like that. Now, in our previous tabletop color exercise, we know that we can use the shape builder tool to get rid of unwanted lines. I'm going to recommend that you get rid of the lines that you don't want as you go, just to keep things nice and clean. But remember, in order to do that properly, those lines all have to be selected. So I'm going to use my black arrow to drag around those shapes, and I'm going to press my command and plus sign a couple of times to zoom in, use my hand tool by pressing the space bar and moving that up. What I'd like to do is get rid of these lines here, because these are not lines that are really helping me in defining my form. So I'm going to come over to my toolbox, and I'm going to choose my Shape Builder tool. And remember, with the Shape Builder tool, with the plus sign, it wants to add shapes together. But if we hold the Option button down, we'll see the minus sign, which tells us that we can now click and get rid of lines. But we have to be careful. Watch this. If I get rid of this line, it got rid of that top, but it also got rid of this part here. Hmm, why did that happen? I'm going to go Command-Z. The reason for that, if I zoom in close enough, is that this line, even though it looks like it intersects, doesn't quite intersect enough with that line for Illustrator to recognize the overlap. If you have that situation, just come over to your toolbox and choose your white arrow, select the anchor point that you want to have overlap, and just drag that a little bit further so that it now overlaps with that shape. I'm going to press Command minus sign a couple times again to zoom back out. Again, I'm going to make sure that, that all the shapes are selected. And again, I'm going to come to my Shape Builder tool. Again, I'm going to hold down my Option button and hover over this line. Now, because I've overlapped those two lines, you'll see that now that line gets removed. So we have to be careful. We don't want to get rid of lines that we meant to keep. Again, I'm going to hold down my Option button and click on this line here. And you can see I can now create 
shapes that generally follow the contours of the face. Now the next thing I'm going to do here though are the eyes and let me show you how I'm going to do that. These eyes are a kind of almond shape. Here's how I'm going to create that. I'm going to create a circle that follows the contour of the lower lid of that eye. I'm going to create another circle that follows the contour of the upper lid of that eye. I'm going to make some small adjustments here and maybe zoom in so I can see this a little bit better. But once I have these two circles lining up roughly the way I want them to to work. I could use my shape builder tool to remove them, but let me caution you about getting rid of these lines too early. If I come back to my pug illustration, you'll notice that there are a number of interior shapes and lines that I kept. For example, the lines around the eyes here or around the muzzle. Even more, if I come back to this lion illustration, you can see all the interior divisions that I kept rather than eliminating. I think keeping interior shapes like this can be really exciting. I'm going to just zoom out just a little bit so I can see this a bit better. You'll notice though that there are some other shapes that go around this eye. For example, the dark part around this eye like that. Here's how I would do that. I'm going to duplicate some of these shapes. For example, I'm going to select this circle and I'm going to hold down the option button and I'm going to click and drag another instance of that circle so it sits over top of the other one like that. I'm going to use the bounding box to resize this just a little bit. So I'm going to duplicate this ellipse and resize it so that it follows that dark shape a little bit better. I'm now going to use my Shape Builder tool to get rid of the lines that I don't want. In this way, I'm going to slowly build up my detail. While doing this part of the exercise, take a look at this file and look at the shapes that were ultimately used and then colored here. This may be helpful. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and complete some of the artwork. I'm going to unlock my photo layer. Now that I've unlocked my photo, I'm just going to zoom out just a little bit, see a little bit more of my artboard, move that off to the side. I'm going to select that photo by clicking on it, and I'm just going to drag it over to the side so I can see it independently of my artwork. Now, I'm going to undo what we had done earlier where we set this up as a guide layer. I'm going to come back to my transparency panel. I'm going to change my blending mode back to normal and I'm going to turn my opacity back up to 100%. What I'm going to do is I'm going to reference some of the colors in this photo so that we can use them to color our artwork. Here's how we're going to do that. I'm going to come over to my rectangle tool and I'm going to create a rectangle just above my artwork here like that. This is going to be a color swatch. I'm going to sample one of the colors from this photograph by coming over to my toolbox and choosing my eyedropper tool. Now the way the eyedropper tool works is that by clicking on an object I can sample that object's color and use it for whatever I currently have selected. But in order to sample a photograph, we have to do it a little bit differently. Rather than just clicking with the eyedropper tool, I have to hold down the shift button at the same time. But when I hold down the shift button and use the eyedropper to click on my photograph, I can fill whatever selected rectangle I have with the color that I clicked on. There is the orange brown of that fox's fur. I'm going to create another rectangle right beside the first one. And again, using the eyedropper tool, I'm going to sample some of the blonde fur by holding down the shift button and clicking like that. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. I'm going to create a number of other swatches, sampling color as I go from the photograph. What I'm hoping to do is create a broad tonal range. I'm going to sample some of the white and the muzzle as well. I think five colors should be enough. There we go. Now we're going to do the same thing that we did in our earlier exercise with the tabletop. We're going to turn our color swatches into a color group in our swatches panel. We're going to come over to our swatches panel and I'm going to click on my options button and I'm going to say new color group. I'm going to say okay. 
there is my new color group. But I want to give myself a few more color tones to work with. So I'm also going to do this. I'm going to select this first one and I'm going to come to my color guide and I'm going to see what kind of colors come up here. The analogous color group here is quite interesting. It gives me some intense oranges. But the complementary group also gives me some really interesting greens. I'm going to go with the analogous for the time being. I'm going to say analogous. And I'm just going to select a range of colors here by holding down the shift button and selecting them here in the color guide. And I'm going to click on this icon here to add those to my swatches panel. But I now have these original five colors selected from this photograph, plus a number of shades and tints of one of those colors to give me enough tonal range to begin this process. We're going to do it the same way we did the tabletop. I'm going to use my black arrow to select those shapes. I'm going to click and hold on my Shape Builder tool and choose my Live Paint Bucket tool. And with those shapes still selected, I'm going to click once and you can see I've now turned this into a live paint group. I'm going to use the colors from my swatches panel and I'm going to begin the coloring process. Now here's a little bit of a troubleshooting thing that I've just come up with. When I created my live color group, this bottom jawline didn't get included. Let me show you what that looks like in the layers panel. If I open up layer two, where my artwork is, you can see that I have two elements, the live paint group that I had selected and this other path that didn't get selected. But I can add this path here into the live paint group by just dragging it in over top of that layer and releasing. It's now a part of that live paint group, and I can now color it. Okay, I'm going to zoom out. The next step is to get rid of the black lines by making sure that the object is selected, and then coming over to our color panel, I'm going to bring the stroke indicator forward and set that to none. I can now take a really close look at this, and I can see that there are a couple of small gaps. If I zoom in here, I can see that there is, in fact, a couple of small areas that need to have a little bit of attention paid. So I'm going to, again, use my paint bucket tool, open up my swatches panel, and do a little bit of touching up here and there in this zoomed-in mode so I can fix this. Okay. Zoom out, look at any other areas that need attention. Okay, so there, there is my fox, mostly. The next step is I'm going to expand the live paint group by coming to the object drop-down menu, selecting live paint, expand. What happens now is that this is no longer a live paint group as we've been working with it. You'll notice that the object no longer reacts to the live paint tool. We can now work with these shapes just as we would with any illustrator shapes. But first, I'm going to ungroup this. I'm going to make sure that it is selected, and I'm going to come to the Object drop-down menu and select Ungroup. I can now select individual shapes of this illustration. We are going to add some gradients, and we're going to try to be as subtle as possible. Let's choose the ear shape up here. I'm going to keep utilizing this light golden brown color, and I'm going to come over to my gradient panel. And again, you can see I have a default white to black gradient ready to be used, but I'm going to use the fill color that I currently have selected for this object, and I'm going to drag it into my gradient slider down below. Again, I'm going to create the world's most subtle color gradient by duplicating that color stop by holding down the Option button and dragging out another instance of it and getting rid of the original color stops that were there. I'm going to drag these to either end of the gradient. This gradient on the right, I'm going to double click that. And again, I'm going to add some darkness by bringing up my magenta and my cyan. And you can see that that color becomes a darker version of itself. But I didn't add black. I've kept the color intensity up. Now that actually doesn't look too bad. The nature of the gradient is a linear gradient from left to right. But I'm going to use my gradient tool in my toolbox and select that. And I'm going to change the gradient so that it goes from the tip of the ear down like so. 
In fact, I may even take my mid value slider and drag that down a little bit so that the darkest part of the gradient is close to the skull. Let me add that same gradient over here. I'm going to select this yellow color and from the gradient panel, I can choose the last gradient that I had selected. However, if I think I'm going to be using this gradient a lot, it might be a good idea to click on the disclosure triangle next to that color swatch and then click here to add that gradient into my swatches panel, as you can see here. But once I've added that gradient, again, I'm going to use my gradient tool to change the angle of that gradient like so. Okay, I'm going to zoom in on the eyes here. I'm going to finish this up by selecting one of the eye shapes and I'm going to create a gradient, dragging that color into it. Again, subtle color gradient. Slightly darker. This time I'm going to make it a radial gradient, however. I'm going to change the placement of that center point so it's a little bit further down in the eye like that. I'm going to sample this gradient. And finally, I'm going to create a new shape. This will be the highlight, and I'm going to put a highlight in both eyes like so. We're going to do one last thing. I'm going to select all the elements that make up my head right now, and I'm going to group them. I'm going to come to the object drop down menu and select group or command G on my keyboard. Now, once these elements are grouped, if I come over to my appearance panel, you'll see that the group is something that I can select. Not only can I select it, I can add an outline around it. If I come down to the Add New Stroke icon at the bottom here, I can click once and create a new stroke that goes around the shapes. Let me show you what that looks like. Hmm, well that doesn't look right, but watch this. With that selected, I'm going to take this stroke property and I'm going to drag it below the Contents section of my Appearance panel. Now, that black outline is behind that shape. I'm going to add some weight to this stroke by clicking on the weight value here and just clicking the up arrow a number of times. If I click off that, you can see, well, that looks okay, but you may in fact have some issues like I have here with a couple of little things sticking out here, but that's something we can fix. I'm going to select my shape. I'm going to select my stroke property here that I've just added in, onto my group and I'm going to come to my stroke panel and I'm going to change the nature of my corners from hard corners to round corners. And you'll see that that gets rid of any of those little flares. I can now come back to my appearance panel and change the color of that if I so choose. I'm going to come back here and I'm going to use the colors in my swatches panel that I created earlier. I'm going to choose the dark brown color like that. Okay. Now, if you want, you can put a background in behind your portrait. I'm going to come to the rectangle tool and I'm just going to draw a rectangle around my face and I'm going to fill that with a color object range sent to back. And there you go. Now we're done our exercise, but hopefully you'll feel more comfortable now adding gradients to your shapes in Illustrator and seeing just how effective they can be. Save your file, put your name on it and submit this to Blackboard.